Ranked choice voting has a long history in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Multi-winner ranked choice voting was used by cities across the state in the 1930s and 1940s to elect their city councils and school committees. Cambridge, Massachusetts is the last city standing from those two decades of reform, making it the oldest ranked choice voting jurisdiction in the country. In 2018, East Hampton and Amherst amended their charters to adopt single-winner or multi-winner ranked choice voting. They'll implement those reforms in the next few years. And this fall, voters in Massachusetts will get to vote on Question 2, the Ranked Choice Voting Initiative. If Ranked Choice Voting gets the most votes on November 3rd, Massachusetts will become the second state in the last five years, after Maine, to adopt Ranked Choice Voting for both state and federal elections. This campaign for Ranked Choice Voting began years ago, and may take a huge leap forward this fall, but its appearance on the ballot was never a sure thing. When COVID-19 descended on the United States in early 2020, the Ranked Choice Voting campaign, like campaigns across the state and across the country, suspended its work. The viability of the ballot measure hung in the balance. How could organizers gather the signatures they needed to get Question 2 on the ballot when the whole state was in lockdown? And how would they campaign in support of Ranked Choice Voting even if they got on the ballot? And even without a pandemic to consider, America is in the midst of a reckoning over racial justice years in the making, and many Americans find themselves politically divided from their friends, family, and neighbors. What place does ranked choice voting hold in the most tumultuous time in American life in decades? The next three episodes are a series chronicling the ranked choice voting campaign in Massachusetts and are a big departure from the standard RCV Clips episode. I interviewed many of the organizers in the Yes on 2 campaign to understand why they focused on ranked choice voting, how the ballot measure came to be, and how they've adapted to the new, enormous challenges to campaigns posed by a global pandemic that is not going away anytime soon. What follows is an attempt to capture some of the lessons they've learned and the thrust of the campaign itself, letting the organizers themselves tell the story in their words as often as possible. Welcome to the October 2020 episode of RCV Clips. My name is Chris Hughes, and I'm a member of the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center team. Let's start, as I probably say too often on this podcast, at the beginning. There's all these different dynamics when you have more than two candidates running for any given office. The emergent problems that arise, like this concept of the spoiler, the concept of having to vote for a lesser evil, or the concept of vote splitting, That's Liz Popolo, Arts and Media Director for the Yes on 2 campaign. These were terms that I hadn't really dug much into, but was curious to understand because in my view, I was seeing a lot of ripple effects from this systemic structure of how we do our elections. And some of those ripple effects were including things like high partisanship, negative campaigning and mudslinging, even Things like straw candidates, where a candidate is put up to run against a mainstream candidate intentionally as a spoiler, oftentimes by the opposition party. So these were some symptoms that I was seeing. And as I tried to dig into why these symptoms came about, the underlying problem I discovered was just the the structure of how we'd run our elections. The idea of first past the post winner-take-all election systems is something that in the U.S. we don't have a lot of other context for. But when you start to learn about elections in other countries and learn that there's many, many different ways to do democracy, um, you learn that, oh, they've actually solved these problems in, in other places. So maybe we could start to solve them here. What Liz said is what I heard in all my interviews for this episode. Ranked choice voting organizers in Massachusetts wanted to create a more constructive politics, one that was about building coalitions and giving every voice more weight, as opposed to a destructive politics devoted to tearing the other side down. They wanted to avoid spoiler candidates who split the vote of major parties. They wanted to create more civil politics. They knew there were solutions that worked. To them, the best way to get there was by adopting ranked choice voting. And if anyone listening doesn't know what ranked choice voting is, I'll explain it quickly. In ranked choice voting, voters rank candidates in order of preference. First choice, second choice, third choice, and so on. Everyone's first choices get counted first, and if somebody has a majority, then that candidate wins. 
If no one has a majority, the candidate with the fewest first choices is eliminated, and those voters' ballots go to their next ranked candidates. This process continues until someone emerges with a majority of votes in a round. In recent years, Massachusetts has seen two high-profile races that make a clear case for ranked choice voting, too. The 2018 Democratic primary in Massachusetts' 3rd Congressional District and the 2020 Democratic primary in Massachusetts' 4th Congressional District. In a deep blue state like Massachusetts, the Democratic primary for a congressional seat is the whole ballgame. Whoever wins the primary is practically guaranteed to go on to win the general election. But both of those contests were held to fill an empty seat. The representative in each had either stepped down to retire, as was the case in the 3rd District, or to run for Senate, as was the case in the 4th District. This meant every possible candidate threw their hat in the ring. Ten candidates ran in the 2018 primary, and the winner emerged with just 21% of the vote. Nine candidates ran in the 2020 primary, and the winner emerged with just 22% of the vote. Two progressive candidates even dropped out of the 2020 primary and tried to throw their weight behind one of their former competitors. These races, for the organizers, epitomized just why ranked choice voting is necessary in Massachusetts. Primaries are low turnout affairs to begin with, and when seats are won with far less than a majority, that means a paltry share of the electorate actually got to choose the whole district's next congressional representative. And we won't even delve into the naughtier issues of Massachusetts politics, a place which is played as true blue because their congressional delegation is all Democrats, but it's also a place where Republicans regularly trade off the governorship with Democrats, and Republican presidential candidates get 40% of the vote statewide. It's not nearly enough to win the state, but it's a pretty sizable minority nonetheless. Plus, like everywhere in the United States, there's complex racial politics and complex local politics at play. But I digress. There are two powerful wings in national and state Democratic parties right now. The moderates, who have controlled the party for decades, and the progressives, who are rapidly rising in power and influence in both deep blue districts like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's New York 14 and purple districts like Katie Porter's California 45, which was represented by Republicans from its creation in 1983 until Katie Porter won it in 2018. Both wings of the party had multiple candidates running in the 3rd District and 4th District primaries. How are candidates supposed to win and distinguish themselves from their competitors when they're running on the same ideas? Standard practice these days is to go negative and tear your competition down. The primaries were knockdown, drag out affairs, and these sorts of competitive primaries can get ugly. Everyone picks their position, people even say things they might not mean, and these primaries tend to end with people unhappy and upset. These fights get ugly because voting for just one candidate encourages aggressive, divisive campaigning because candidates need to run up their total. But it's also to their benefit to drive down everyone else's support by making their competition seem like liars or Johnny-come-latelys or sycophants who say whatever it takes to win. And when you start to describe ranked choice voting as the solution to those exact problems, you see that that light in their eyes where they go, oh, yeah, now now you're telling me about something that I could get behind. And you really start to see people embrace the idea. And overwhelmingly, when we would have those conversations, easily nine out of 10 people say, yeah, I love that idea, regardless of their partisanship, regardless of their, you know, political party or their whatever demographic they identify with, people really want to feel like their elections are something they can feel hopeful for again, because I think we've reached such a point of negativity and voting out of fear rather than voting out of hope for something that people are really ready for this idea. It's, a, it's an idea whose time has finally arrived. Creating this sort of democratic legitimacy feels even more pressing now, as the United States barrels through and towards what appears to be the most destabilizing election in our history. While most of the messages aren't new, unfounded accusations of fraud, mistakes made by underfunded and overworked elections offices, some are dangerously autocratic. An incumbent president saying he'll refuse to concede if he loses, casting doubt on an elections process relying on vote by mail in unprecedented ways, and seeding doubt in the legitimacy of our elections administration writ large. Ranked choice voting won't solve all of these problems, but it may be an important part of healing the massive divisions in America right now. 
That's the why. But how did the movement for ranked choice voting in Massachusetts come together? My name's Greg Dennis. I am the policy director for the Yes on Two campaign. Once upon a time, uh, there was a presidential election in the year 2000, you may have heard of it, where there were lots of claims that there were lots of voters who wanted to vote for you know, third party or independent candidates in that race and felt like they couldn't. Um, that was the first presidential election I was old enough to vote in and I was in college at the time. And I was really struck by that conundrum of you know, lots of college students wanting to vote for Ralph Nader in that election. You know, there were also some independent right-leaning voters that wanted to vote for Pat Buchanan. And these voters feeling like they they couldn't, that they'd be throwing their vote away. Um, and ultimately, we saw, you know, a president win without a majority of the vote, not a majority either of the popular vote nationwide, but not a majority of the vote in Florida, that crucial swing state. And at the same time, you know, I'm in college and I'm using ranked choice voting to elect student government offices and thinking, well, here's the solution to the problem. You know, it's right here in front of us. Why aren't we using it? And so I became an advocate um, of the reform from that time and met up with, you know, the other sort of key founders of the organization in Massachusetts I started um, a local effort in the city I was living in at the time, Somerville, Massachusetts, a uh, little a local effort called Somerville IRV. Try to push instant runoff voting in Somerville. There were uh, occasional bills in the state house that we would we would ask people to call their state reps and state senators to support those bills, show up at the state house, ask people to vote for them, and so on. And through that kind of informal organizing and network, we had a small list of people interested and three of those core people formed, including myself, uh, formed the basis for the first organization in 2016, Voter Choice Massachusetts. And before we get any farther, let's note now, this campaign has gone by many names. In the early days, it was Voter Choice Massachusetts. Then it became Voter Choice for Massachusetts. Then the Ranked Choice Voting 2020 Committee. And now the Yes on Two campaign. These names represent different legal forms the organization took that are meant to do different kinds of political work. This first episode is about Voter Choice Massachusetts and Voter Choice for Massachusetts. Episode two is about the Ranked Choice Voting 2020 Committee. And episode three, the Yes on Two campaign. All these different forms kept the same people, but shape-shifted their legal form to meet the goals they were focused on at the time. Voter Choice Massachusetts on educating people about ranked choice voting in general and building their list of supporters. Voter Choice for Massachusetts on lobbying legislators to support ranked choice voting. The Ranked Choice Voting 2020 Committee on getting their ranked choice voting initiative on the ballot. And yes on two on winning the ballot campaign for ranked choice voting. We had a a list of people that we knew were interested in pursuing ranked choice voting generally. And we, we were engaged with the main camp. We knew about the main campaign, the ballot initiative in Maine to enact ranked choice voting. And we participated in that from Massachusetts, calling voters, um, some of us donating money, just doing what we could to help that campaign win. And when it did win, um, you know, it was, a you know, huge boost to our confidence, and it was a game changer in terms of the viability of this reform in other states. And we thought, well, if Maine can do it, why can't Massachusetts do it? So we called together um, a meeting from this list of maybe a couple hundred people. We all met in a – about 50 people showed up, which was more people than we thought would show up <laughs> – uh, all cramming into this small office in, in downtown Boston. And we just started organizing just as volunteers. We didn't have any money, any paid staff, any website or anything. Voter Choice Massachusetts had a ton of volunteer energy coming off the 2016 election and needed some way to channel that energy. They wanted to be the next state after Maine to truly change how their elections work. Making that happen was going to be a big task. 
Maine had been discussing ranked choice voting for years by the time it passed. A bill to adopt ranked choice voting nearly got through the Maine state legislature in 2013, but died at the last minute. That bill then became Question 5, which adopted ranked choice voting in the state in 2016. Meanwhile, Massachusetts had a history of ranked choice voting in Cambridge, but it had been long enough since then that ranked choice voting as a reform wasn't at the top of anyone's mind. So the organizers had to build a lot of groundwork in the state. We quickly started to recognize some of our basic needs, like a team around, you know, how to put together a a website, how to put together a social media team, um, some legal guidance, some um, legislative guidance. So we we started to form these just organic little sub teams. We did a lot of public outreach, you know, showing up at various political events and street festivals and fairs and all kinds of things with literature. We, we built out a website and built out a list of people interested, and we started raising money in really small amounts, little by little. And most of us, you know, just all of us working as volunteers, um, some of us uh, working at this volunteer work as almost a second job, right? Like just devoting many, many hours to trying to make this happen. Voter Choice Massachusetts knew people wanted to work on and devote time to ranked choice voting. In a year, they grew that 50-person meeting and 200-person list to 8,000 people, and by the end of 2018, had tripled that to 24,000. By that point, both East Hampton and Amherst had adopted ranked choice voting for future local elections, but the organizers had their sights set on a bigger prize, adopting ranked choice voting statewide. They had major elected officials in the state, like Congressman Seth Moulton and Secretary of State Bill Galvin, the chief election administrator in the state, supporting ranked choice. So they started work on a legislative strategy. I'll let Greg and Liz talk a bit about how they went about working the legislature for RCV. We worked to put together um, two bills for the Massachusetts State House. Uh, and we formed um, a lobbying organization as opposed to a purely educational organization. We we had a C3. We formed a C4 to lobby for those bills. Brief aside, C3s and C4s are two different types of nonprofit organizations. C3s are educational and civic-minded. Think uh, the League of Women Voters or us, the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center. Your donations to them are also tax-deductible. C4s are more political organizations. They advocate specific policies to elected officials and try to get those officials to pass particular bills. Think Sunrise Movement or the NRA. We actually did do a full education effort, and we met with as many of the 200 state Senate and state representatives that we could in what we called our 200 Coffees campaign, which we sat down with constituents and had coffee with every single one of them. Really just try try to do basic education about what is ranked choice voting, why we support it for Massachusetts, what difference it would make in our elections, how it would really make voters feel like their voices mattered more. And so we did do a heavy amount of legislative work. In January 2019, those meetings paid off. Ranked choice voting bills were introduced in the House and Senate and referred to the legislature's Joint Committee on Elections. Committees in legislatures are where the details of bills get hammered out. Members discuss the value of bills, suggest amendments, hold hearings where experts testify on those bills, and ultimately decide whether to support a bill. If a bill gets a majority vote in the committee, it goes to the House or Senate floor, where the bill is once more debated and potentially amended. If a bill passes on the floor, it gets referred to the other House of the legislature, where the process starts all over again. If the bill finally passes out of that second house, it goes to the governor's desk, where it is either signed into law or painfully vetoed. None of those things happened with the ranked choice voting bill, though. As with the vast majority of bills introduced in state legislatures, in Congress, even in city councils, the ranked choice voting bills were sent to committee where the bills languished. Legislators debated the bills. Advocates even worked with legislators to hammer out the fine details of how the bills operate. A hearing was scheduled but not enough legislators signed on for the bill to clearly have life. Yeah, we formed the lobbying organization to lobby for the bills, continued to build our list, continued to raise money, eventually raised enough money to hire some staff. Uh, that was a big change for us. You know, it's, it is tough to enact 
uh, ranked choice voting legislation at the um, at the state level. And, the you know, there's legislators are reluctant to enact it um, for, you know, you could claim cynical reasons, but also good reasons. And the cynical reason is they got elected under a system and they don't want to change the system that got elected to them. Why do that? Why, you know, uh, rock the boat in any way if it could change who wins? The the kind of non-cynical reason is a state with a ballot initiative like Massachusetts. Well, maybe legislators shouldn't be tinkering with the system that elects them because they could then tinker with it. They could then tinker with the system to their own benefit. We understood that the likelihood of passing legislation was relatively low, but we thought there was good value in do- trying it anyway. One, because, well, who knows? Maybe you'll be successful. Maybe you'll get lucky and you'll pass something that way. And that's a lot easier than going through a ballot initiative. But the other benefits is it allows you to hone your message, to hone your legislation, to interact with legislators and hear their concerns and use their feedback in perhaps refining the legislation, refining the message, answering tough questions and those sorts of things. And that, um, yeah, we just saw a lot of value in going through the process of trying to enact a piece of legislation because that process elicited a lot of feedback for us about things we wanted in the bill, ways to phrase the legislation, how to properly answer certain concerns and address concerns that legislators and elected officials would have. As you may be able to guess based on how this episode started, the organizers knew they had another angle available, the ballot initiative. The ballot initiative route is there for the voters to use if they want to change the voting system. So um, so have at it. And so that's the direction we went and we decided to form a ballot campaign. Ballot initiatives are a way for people to put a law directly on the ballot to ask the voters themselves to act like a legislature and decide whether to adopt a given law. There are two major components to ballot measures qualifying to appear on the ballot which requires gathering thousands of signatures from voters and campaigning for that ballot measure once you qualify for the ballot, which requires winning many more thousands of votes. Historically, campaigns assume both steps require a massive amount of face-to-face contact between supporters of the campaign and voters across a state. The laws regulating these sorts of campaigns also assume a lot of in-person contact. Signatures must be wet ink, as in written down in person by people using pens, for one example. And plus, people get energized when meeting people in person and hearing about a new idea about a candidate. They're excited to be so directly involved in our democracy. That excitement turns to support. People sign on to ballot measures, they turn up to vote for those measures, they might even turn into volunteers themselves. What happens then when a -a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic settles upon the country and nearly all face-to-face interaction stops? How can you gather voter signatures at state fairs or at busy intersections when any event larger than 10 people is going to get canceled and people are even less likely to stop and talk to a random stranger holding a clipboard? How do you go door to door asking people to support your ballot measure when that could become a dangerous vector for disease that frequently presents no symptoms in one person and is a death sentence in another? All of Voter Choice Massachusetts' work leading up to their decision to become a ballot measure campaign from 2016 through early 2019 happened far before the pandemic settled upon us and assumed 2020 would be a standard election year. As you heard in this episode, they covered all their bases, creating an enormous statewide list of grassroots supporters, hammering out details of legislation, getting local adoptions. They even got endorsements and support from the vast majority of elected officials in the state. They even had nine of the 10 candidates in that fourth congressional district primary endorse ranked choice voting, which may come as no surprise to you. To get on the 2020 ballot, Massachusetts required collecting 80,239 signatures between September and November 2019. Then a second smaller round of signature gathering of 13,374 signatures in spring 2020. Collecting all those signatures would be the first true test of the strength of their network. With more than 20,000 people signed up for Voter Choice Massachusetts, could they gather those tens of thousands of signatures and get on the ballot? 16 ballot measures applied to appear on the 2020 ballot. Two made it on. 
Question two, the ranked choice voting initiative, was one of them. Our next episode follows the organizers of the initiative in Massachusetts as they ramp up their campaign in fall 2019 and grapple with the challenges of the pandemic in winter and spring of 2020. Tune in to RCV Clips in November to learn how the organizers beat the odds in more ways than one to get on that 2020 ballot. And now for this month's final round, where we share an interesting bit of trivia, useful tidbit, or just something we thought was cool for folks to know about ranked choice voting. Here's Rosemary Blizzard with this month's final round. Did you know that Albany, California might adopt multi-winner RCV this fall? Measure BB is on the ballot for Albany voters, and if passed, would implement multi-winner ranked choice voting for city council and school board races. This is the same kind of ranked choice voting used in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Minneapolis, Minnesota, East Point, Michigan, Australia's Senate, Ireland's Dale, and Northern Ireland's Assembly, among others. Thank you for joining us today for our October RCV clip. This is a podcast produced by the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at RCV Resources, on Facebook and LinkedIn at Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center, and check out our website, rankedchoicevoting.org, for more RCV resources. You can find our show anywhere you get podcasts. Please take some time to subscribe to, rate, and review the podcast, too. The songs heard in this episode are Kitten and Jester by Poddington Bear. We hope you're all staying safe and healthy and protecting yourselves and your loved ones from COVID-19. And make sure to get your vote in. Thanks to Greg Dennis, Jim Henderson, Liz Popolo, Joel Paul, and Kobe Yank Jacobs for taking the time out of their busy schedules to talk to me for this episode and the next two. Until next time, I'm Chris Hughes on behalf of Rosemary Blizzard and the rest of the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center. Mm-hmm.